Uh, today, I'm going to talk about building digital relationships, marketing in the relationship era. And I think what you'll find is that this is a nice extension to what David talked about. We're going to take a lot of the concepts that David was introducing, expand on them a little bit, and actually hopefully provide you with a framework that's a little closer to our industry, right, and how we can use some of those concepts uh, within the professional services era. Uh, but just real briefly, I think it's important to note why this is important. Oftentimes in professional services, we get asked the question from uh, lawyers, consultants, et cetera, why do we need a website? Why is this really important? Uh, they say, all of my business comes through my relationships. And I, I don't, I used to challenge that. I don't challenge that anymore because the reality is their business does come to them through their relationships. But increasingly, digital is playing a more important part of it. And we often show business to consumer examples because they're ahead of the curve, right? We always lag a little bit behind business to consumer. But I would propose to you that the people that are going to be making buying decisions of all of our services, including One Norse, in 10 or 20 years aren't going to look like necessarily even the people in this room. They're going to have been brought up in the relationship era and been brought up in natively digital environments. And that's what I really want to talk about today. So I thought it'd be fun to actually start with an article from the 1982 New York Times. And it was a prediction around what technology, uh, the predictions around what technology would do to our society. And I'm going to do what you're never supposed to do in a presentation and actually read the next few slides uh, just so you don't have to. Uh, the report suggests that one-way and two-way home information systems called teletext and videotext will penetrate deeply into daily life with an effect on society as profound as those of the automobile, commercial television earlier in this, earlier in this century. So this is from 1982, 31 years ago. Just to put that in perspective, for people that are actually around at this time, I looked it up. And the number one song in 1982 was Physical by Olivia Newton-John. <laughs> so pretty amazing uh, prediction on uh, the role of technology. Obviously, they got some of the nomenclature wrong, but pretty amazing. And it actually continues. They said, individuals may be able to use video tech systems to create their own newspapers, design their own curricula, compile their own consumer guides. What this is really speaking to is one of the fundamental shifts that digital has brought about, and that is the democratization of publishing. It no longer matters if you have millions or billion dollars to, uh, to market with. Somebody who's got an idea or has an opinion on a subject and maybe has no money, just has access to the internet, can now have just as much of an effect as a brand that's spending millions or billions on, uh, on general awareness. And when you think about it today, this is actually fairly accurate. In newspapers, you've got blogs, which are essentially opinion pieces. You've got mashups. You've got Zeit, which is an app that actually builds a newspaper for you based on what you're interested in. From a curriculum perspective, I mean, you heard about it from David. I, I won't even talk more about that. And then when you think about compiling consumer guides, when was the last time you bought a product online and you didn't look at a review, right? This is something that has just become part of the way we operate. It's all because of democratization of publishing. Home-based shopping will permit consumers to control manufacturing directly, ordering exactly what they need for production on demand. This is a really interesting one because to me, this means the hyperlinked world. Everything is hyperlinked today. Law firms are now uh, competing with offshore providers because technology has now enabled that. That wasn't even around when I started back at Hubbard One in 2000. Right? And this has all been enabled by the fact that we are a completely hyperlinked society uh, today. A couple years ago, we talked about the Internet of Things. Does anybody know what the Internet of Things is? Anybody want to define it in front of a room full of people? <laughs> Jeff, why don't you define it for us? Exactly. The Internet of Things is this idea now that there are more things attached to the Internet than there are people. So think of an example, and this might be a, a fairly simple example, but it'd be pretty cool. Uh, you have an alarm clock that wakes you up every day. And maybe you drive to work. Well, what if that alarm clock adjusted the time that it woke you up at so uh, that you would be able to prepare for traffic patterns? So if there's more traffic or the weather's bad on one day, that alarm clock adjusted 15 minutes behind, right? That's an example of the Internet of Things. Or what if your washing machine, for a lack of a better example, turned on automatically at a time when the power grid uh, was uh, at lower than capacity, right? These things have profound effects for us, but it's all because of the hyperlinked world. Uh, another example here, there will be a shift away from conventional workplace and school socialization. Friends, peer groups, and alliances will be determined electronically, creating classes of people based on interests and skills rather than age and social class. 
Well, this is obvious, right? We're all socially networked, but I think it has particular uh, impacts for the people in this room, right? Because we work in professional services, and so often the sale that is made is a result of centers of influence, right? People that provide influence over other people that then buy the services from uh, the firms in this room, and even from One North. And what's happened now is our universe of influencers has expanded dramatically. It's not just people in our neighborhood or people that we work with or people of our social class. It's now much broader. We can find that, that very microscopic segment of the population that's interested in exactly what we're in. Right? It's not, and the internet provides that. It's not just the people that are immediately around us. Right? So centers of influences have expanded. This is one we can all relate to. I will not be offended if anybody is checking their Blackberry or iPhone during this presentation for this exact reason, right? The blurring of lines between home and work, the report stated, will raise difficult issues such as working hours. We're going to talk about branding later and, and customer experience, but really what this is getting at is the fact that customer service expectations have changed. We all carry these devices with us. You have other priorities, uh, not only today while you're here during working hours of this presentation, but even when you go home. Uh, and if you think about it, how many uh, service providers provide a 24-hour access to customer call centers and things along those lines 10, 15 years ago. Not that many. They only provided that during business hours. This has changed the way we have to provide service. This is definitely something the, uh, the lawyers uh, in the room would understand. All right, this one I don't quite get. The extended family might be recreated if the elderly can support themselves through electronic homework, making them more desirable to have around. <laughs> So it's a, it's a pretty good uh, set of predictions with this being the one exception. It, it seems like somebody who wrote this, uh, this article might have had like an in-law that was living with them and just had to <laughs> get, that, get that jab in there. Um, but uh, interesting nonetheless, I'm not really sure. I've read this like 100 times, I still don't know what it means. Uh, so what does this mean? Well, this means we've now entered what is called the relationship era. When you think of the democratization of the publishing engine's hyperlinked uh, world, uh, when you think of the centers of influence is expanding, customer service changing, uh, and uh, in many cases expanding, and uh, the expectations around that expanding, this has led to what's called the relationship era. The relationship era uh, is not a One North concept. This is a generally accepted marketing principle, if you will. Uh, and let me define that for you. And I will use a definition here because it, it, it syncs up well with what David talked about. Uh, the shift to relationship uh, era approach suggests a decreasing reliance on the traditional use of mass media to influence and persuade passive audiences to buy more of whatever the marketer is trying to sell. Relationship era marketers embrace approaches that build stronger relationships between their brands and people. Right? We're no longer screaming from the rooftops. There's a fellow by the name of Bob Garfield that I'm going to quote in a minute uh, who's written extensively on this. Very. Uh, very interesting speaker on the topic of the relationship era. And he always says that you really should stop screaming about your ad slogan or your message anymore because the bottom line is, is that nobody is listening anymore. Nobody is listening to you just speak or advertise your messages. Nobody really wants to. So I thought we'd do a quick unscientific test. If you consider or if you believe the hypothesis that that relationship-based brands develop better experiences for their audience and achieve better results than ones that don't, then this little unscientific test should hold true. So how many of you have Apple products in the audience? How many of those, or how many of you would actually recommend those Apple products to other people who were looking for a device or whatever? Pretty much the same set of hands that just raised before, right? Well, this is the unscientific portion of this. If you have Apple and you type in, in quotes, I love Apple into Google, at least last week, you got 8.5 million results. I actually did it earlier this week, and it was like 8.7 million. So clearly, people are talking about this a lot and saying how much they love Apple. Uh, an example that was used before, I love Starbucks, gets about 2.5 million. Uh, I think about a million of those are from Don Michelak over there. <laughs> clearly, some other people in the room. Uh, all right, I'm going to bring up a brand that just gets so bashed on, and I apologize because I fly them like every week. United Airlines, all right? So let me give you a quick story that happened just two days ago. Uh, Brad Vesprini, over there, Brad and I had to fly to New York on very short notice, right? Uh, so we had to do a day trip, which meant that we had to take a 6 a.m. flight. And that meant that we had to get up at 4 a.m. We were pretty psyched about that, right? The week of Experience Lab, lots going on, but we had to get up really early to take this flight. So I get up really early, 
go to the airport, Brad meets me there, we get onto this plane, I just can't wait to go to sleep, right? I, get, I sit down in the, uh, the, the chair, um, I've got two hours to sleep before our meetings in New York, I'm exhausted, I'm just starting to doze off. And what happens? Well, on comes the United video, right? And there's no escape because it's like on the screen that flips down and broadcasts through the audio. I have to watch this video, right? Remember, I was half asleep. And in this, it's Jeff Smysick, who is the CEO of United Airlines. And he seems like a nice enough guy, right? Um, you know, probably pretty trustworthy and very passionate about the United brand. But what he's telling me is how great they are and how they're making all these changes and the merger with Continental is going great and blah, 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 blah. And I'm thinking to myself, here you are broadcasting the features of your product to me at a time when the experience I want is for you to shut up and for me to sleep, <laughs> right? And that's why, perhaps, <laughs> Again, I'm not a United hater. If you went to LMA this year, you probably saw the video United Hates Guitars. Uh, if you haven't, it's really funny. Basically, they broke a, uh, a professional mus musician's guitar. It was like a $5,000 guitar. Uh, and he wrote a song, because they wouldn't you know, do well by him, about United breaking guitars. And it went viral. Uh, so check that out if you haven't. I took it out of this presentation because I think it might have been a little bit overplayed. Um, but unfortunately, they, uh, they've taken quite a beating, and, and I'm going to beat on them some more here. I love Satan. <laughs> 775,000 uh, results. Um, so more people love Satan than United Airlines, apparently. Uh, but that's the unscientific test, right? The idea is that, that brands that create a relationship with their audience actually do better than brands that don't, right, and create a customer experience. Uh, and this is the Bob Garfield quote that I just wanted to put up here. I heard this first at uh, South by Southwest this year, and it had a huge impact on me and really made the relationship era come alive. You know, his, his idea was, look, stop broadcasting from the rooftops. Nobody cares about your message anymore. Nobody cares about what you say. Nobody cares even about your creativity and how creatively you deliver that message. What they ultimately care about is what other people think and what their experience is right, with your brand. And so I would propose to you that as we've talked about the relationship era, today, when we talk about branding, your brand is your client's experience. It's not what you say it is, because they are having conversations with other people, whether it's online or offline, about how good you are, about the type of service you provide, and that is what your brand really is all about. We spend a lot of time thinking creatively and coming up with creative concepts around what we think our brand is, but at the end of the day, it's their experience. And that's probably where we don't focus enough effort. And that's in the relationship era where we have to focus our effort. So I want to talk a little bit about some of, these, um, some of these truths, if you will, within the relationship era. And the first is that in the relationship era, we've moved from service transactions to actual personal interactions. So let me bring up an example of American Express. How many people carry an American Express card with them? OK, lots of people. Traditionally, advertising around the credit cards Focus on the features, right? Well, you know, you'll get cash back, or you know, you'll you'll get this or that, and they focus on the card and what it looks like and how cool it is to actually carry it around. What American Express is, they realize that that's not what anybody cares about. They don't care about the features of the credit card. They want a personal experience, and so they actually rolled out a campaign. And what's important about this, it's not just a campaign; it's actually a philosophy. Uh, and the campaign is entitled "That's uh, What It Feels Like to Be a Member." And the campaign is focused on the client experience rather than uh, simply the features of the product. And so I'll give you a quick example. Here's one, obviously, a, an advertisement um, talking about the experience, not the features. They have some, I don't know, feature whereby you can fly through customs. But uh, here's an example where a consultant who travels quite a bit uses American Express card, was booking his honeymoon. And he used his American Express card, called American Express Travel, booked his trip to Hawaii with his new bride. Uh, and little did he know that, and he didn't know this until he actually got to Hawaii, that they took the opportunity, recognizing that it was his honeymoon and caring about the fact that it was his honeymoon and not looking at this purely as a transaction, they went ahead, they upgraded his suite for free, and they gave him and his wife $100 gift cards, if you will, to be used for massages or anything else along those lines, and they bought them dinner at the Japanese restaurant at the actual hotel he was staying at. Right? That is a personal interaction. That's making it personal. That's an experience. Right? And so what did he do? He went back and blogged about it and said, you know, this is basically the type of organization that I'm going to be a customer of for life. 
So moving from service transactions to personal interactions. All right, this is one of the most bizarre examples I've ever used in any sort of presentation, but we're going to roll with it a little bit. Uh, does anybody like chewable ice? Did anybody know that there's actually different types of ice and that there are aficionado, aficionados of ice? Nobody, right? I didn't either until I started researching for this presentation. Um, this is an example from Scotsman. And they apparently manufacture machines that they then send to distributors that create this ice called the nugget. And this is chewable ice. I think I've had this now that I sort of remember. But it's like ice that's made in a special way that is chewable. I thought ice was just sort of water and cold air. But uh, apparently, there's more to it than that. And so as they were rolling out the nugget, remember, they don't market to end consumers. They actually market to distributors. They decided, look, we have this loyal following of people who like our chewable ice. So how can we move from a marketing-led transaction to a user-led demand interaction? And so what they did is they built this website that's actually for the end consumer, the people that like the nugget ice. Uh, they rolled this out. And within it, you can demand where you want to have nugget ice. You can even <laughs> demand that they bring a truck to like your next birthday party or something like that. You have to really like nugget ice for that. But the point is, is they've given their, uh, their end consumers an opportunity to tell them where they wanted to interact, right? Uh, an interesting example, actually, during that trip to New York two days ago that I heard about, um, closer, obviously, to home, uh, there was a group of financial institutions that, uh, obviously, they have very strict privacy and security parameters around customer data and things like that, right? Citibank, et cetera. They are way ahead of the game in terms of security, uh, really more than any other industry. But they work with the legal industry, frankly, that is sort of behind the times in terms of technology security. And the uh, financial institutions got together and said, you know what? It's not acceptable that we have to treat our customer data uh, so carefully and have all these protocols in place and are leading the industry. Yet the law firms that we use, they don't seem to have the same standards when they're working with us on matters that are important to us. So they got together as a group, these financial institutions, and actually went to a group of law firms, prominent law firms in New York, and said, help solve this problem. And of course, the law firm said, absolutely, right? But we've moved to a world where those financial institutions are networked, and they have power, and they can come together and actually create demand. That's the relationship era. Uh, other interesting thing about um, moving to user-led demand is that actual business models are coming up around user-led demand products. So I don't know if anybody uses Waze, but Waze is an app. Brad uses it, apparently. I didn't even know you had a car, uh, but apparently he does. Um, Waze is an app that is for traffic reporting. So it basically tells, I can tell you where the police are, what the traffic's like, and it's all based on the fact that everybody is contributing to this. Uh, interestingly, last week, if you read the newspaper, you'll know that a cannonball run was accomplished from, I think it was New York to LA, and they broke the speed record 29 hours from New York to LA in this like modified Mercedes, and they had ways on board to make sure they didn't get busted by the cops. Uh, so great example of um, a sort of user-led demand and the fact that the experience right, of all these users creates a collective experience that's become a business model. Jawbone is uh, similar. Jawbone, we actually have an employee that, that uses uh, Jawbone. It, it tracks his activity during the day and then syncs it up with uh, a website where he can compare uh, his interaction with other people, et cetera. And I think we're all familiar with Yelp. You know, Yelp has really taken off. I remember Yelp maybe three or four years ago. It didn't seem to uh, offer much. Nowadays, you know, I wouldn't hire any service provider or go to any restaurant without uh, viewing Yelp first. All right, so the last thing I want to talk about as it relates to attributes of the relationship era is this fact that we've moved from astructured research processes to organic discovery. Now, to, to give you an example of this, I'm going to actually take a step back and talk for a minute about Procter & Gamble. And this is a bit of marketing history that I learned in the course of uh, putting together this presentation. Has anybody heard of the first moment of truth? FMOT. Steve, I think you might be the only one. So FMOT, the first moment of truth, George has two in the back. Uh, first moment of truth was coined by Procter & Gamble. We all know Procter & Gamble. They have class-leading products, uh, CPG products, and vir virtually all the categories they participate in. Uh, and they coined this term, first moment of truth, to mean the first three to seven seconds when somebody walked into a grocery store 
And that first three to seven seconds when they looked at a product or a set of products and all of the advertising that Procter & Gamble had done over the course of whatever time period, that's in those three to seven seconds when that moment of truth came about where the person decided whether or not they were going to buy the product, right? Three to seven seconds when I'm staring at the product. That's where all the combined advertising uh, plays into your purchasing decision. Google just rolled out a handbook uh, called ZMOT, which stands for Zero Moment of Truth. And what this speaks to is organic discovery. The idea here is that when you look at a product, you don't simply go to the store and buy the product anymore. Instead, you reach out to your network. That is the zero moment of truth. You reach out to your network and say, what do you think about this? Or you go to the web and you perform a search and you see reviews and you see other things. That happens before the first moment of truth. It's actually changed the way we buy. So they've actually rolled out a handbook. This is primarily for B2C consumers and people are selling product um, over the web about how to capitalize on the ZMOT. For us, since we're not selling product online, the ZMOT really is how do you get your content in front of somebody who's got a problem in a way uh, that helps them as early in the process as possible, right? Whether it's thought leadership or whatever it might be. And I actually had an example, a uh, personal example that, that hit me about the, with the ZMOT right when I was preparing for this. Uh, this is a Facebook group that somehow I got added to. It's a group of legal marketers. And one of the legal marketers, someone I, I don't actually know, maybe some of you in the room do, uh, was asking about competitive intelligence products. And she was looking for a competitive intelligence product, went out to Facebook, posted this to a group of three or 400 legal marketers, uh, and then she started getting feedback, and they were starting to discuss the various attributes of, of the products. Right? So this really is organic discovery. It's not just about going to the competitive intelligence vendor's website and learning about what they had to say about it. Instead, I go to my network. I'll give you a quick sort of funny example. What I love about organic discovery is it provides great marketing opportunities. Uh, this is uh, Taco Bell, another bizarre example to be using. This guy, Patrick Salaby, or however you pronounce his name, I don't know what he was doing, but I can guess when he, he tweeted this. He said, if Taco Bell thinks they're revolutionary by putting nachos inside of a burrito, then they've never met a drunk person. OK, notice that he didn't do uh, and at Taco Bell. He was just talking to his network. And I don't know who follows this guy, but probably a lot of people. Uh, and Taco Bell saw this and responded a few hours later. <laughs> this is fantastic, right? But this is a user-led transaction, right? This is being in the moment. This is speaking their language. Uh, this is organic. What a tremendous marketing opportunity. It says to us, Taco Bell doesn't take themselves that seriously, right? And there's another Taco Bell example coming up later on that's, uh, that's a little more uh, troubling. <laughs> I'll just put it that way. Um, so I think what's, what's interesting about all these concepts, organic discovery, et cetera, is how this affects B2B. Uh, and, and that's really what we care about here in this room. And what's happening to B2B buying processes? And the, the reality is they're all moving to the desktop. It's not purely uh, the, off, or the offline relationship anymore. And so I was looking for research on how the B2B buying relationship has actually changed as a result of digital. And I found some interesting statistics. The first is that 30% of organizations, uh, only 30% of organizations still cold call. That's amazing, right? And that's because of the zero moment of truth, right? We can do our own research now, right? We'll contact the vendor when we want. That's shocking to me. I, my father was a salesman, and cold calling was just what you did. That's really, really changed. And then McKinsey rolled out a study, and they found that 50% uh, of purchase decisions are actually made before a supplier is contacted. The implications for us, of course, is that your web presence and what you do and how you present content and the context of it and how you create that experience early in the process is actually what's going to help them buy. And this is what's changing over time, right? I thought I'd share this as well. This is uh, Kleiner Perkins. They roll out a, uh, a study on the internet every year. It's fascinating. If you don't know Kleiner Perkins, venture capital firm out in Silicon Valley, and they always have a very forward-looking uh, perspective on what's going on uh, in digital trends. And I pulled this out because I think that we tend to think that since Facebook and LinkedIn were developed here in the US, that we're uh, the experts at all things social media and that we're ahead of the game. But what I found interesting here was that we actually share less than many other countries. So the US and the UK, we're at about 15%. Uh, where's the UK here? They're right around us. 
um, they're probably about a little over 10%. But when you look at other countries like China or India, they're sharing dramatically more than we are, right? So assuming that we, right, as consumers, continue to move along this path and start to share more and more as younger people enter the workforce, people that are used to uh, doing this as a matter of course, uh, all of a sudden we're going to be marketing to people that are sharing virtually everything that we provide. And we're going to look a whole lot more like Saudi Arabia. And that has profound impacts, right, for organic discovery because organic discovery has only become that much more important. Some people uh, I know on Facebook share a lot more than 50% of the stuff they see. Uh, what's really interesting is some of the large consumer brands have dramatically shifted what they're doing nowadays in terms of their marketing spend um, versus many years ago. So this is Procter & Gamble. Everyone knows Procter & Gamble. I talked about them earlier. We all use their products. They uh, have been known forever as being sort of the leader in CPG marketing. They've defined marketing. Uh, any business school uses tons of their case studies. Uh, but what they're doing is actually shifting their spend fairly dramatically because what they've realized is simply buying Super Bowl ads and doing tons of advertising isn't really working for them anymore. They want to have a one-to-one -one relationship with, as they say, every person on the planet, everybody that's actually using their products. And that's the relationship era. And that's much harder to produce, but much more beneficial. So they're taking what is literally billions of dollars in marketing spend, toning it down, talking less about themselves, and trying to create experiences for their audience. Here's just another example from them. Their philosophy is we, uh, we feel that the best form of marketing is the kind that does not feel like marketing. And that's ultimately what they're trying to do. Uh, and this is a huge shock. Uh, David mentioned earlier to traditional advertising agencies who are saying, you know, wait a second, we know how to create Super Bowl ads. You know, we know how to create these mass media campaigns. Well, no one's listening to mass media anymore. We're in the relationship era now. And it's about the experience you have with a brand. So what I wanted to do now was take everything we've talked about and everything that David has talked about and propose to you a model that we've been using at One North. Uh, David talked about the traditional sales funnel. We're all familiar with it, right? You add a bunch of leads to the top, pardon me, of the sales funnel, and that's typically generated by marketing. At the end, out drops a client. Okay, marketing is done, right? We accomplished our objective. We generated revenue. We brought a new client in the door. That really doesn't work for the organizations that One North is or the organizations that you are. There's a different model that has to work because that's not what our marketing is all about. So we looked sort of far and wide for a model and thought about creating our own model and then eventually adapted one from McKinsey that we really liked that sort of speaks to the buying process uh, of your clients and frankly our clients as well. We call this the relationship cycle and I'll give you a quick orientation to this. Uh, if you think about it, if you think about your client's needs, they'll first identify a need. I've got an upcoming cross-border transaction, right? They identify that need, and then they ultimately go research a solution. That's a, that's a zero moment of truth type opportunity, right? If you can present content that's relevant to them and their cross-border transaction at that time, you're in really, really good shape. But then once they research a solution, typically they go into active evaluation. And I would guess that if, if they haven't found exactly what they're looking for in researching a solution, or they haven't found a vendor that they know uh, can provide them services there, they go into a formal active evaluation phase. And this is what we all hate. This is the RFP, right? At the end, right, once they've gone through that active evaluation, they formalize a relationship. And this is where the traditional sales funnel ends, right? Great, we formalize a relationship with the service provider. We're done. But what's different about the relationship era, and what's different about professional services, is that we have this really important loop that happens after a relationship's been formalized. Right? And this is often the piece that's hardest for us as marketers to control, because this is when the professionals take control. Uh, and that happens right here. Right? So once we formalize a relationship, that's our opportunity to build trust and advocacy with the audience. And if we can do that, if we can build trust and advocacy and build a client that really believes in what we do and trusts the advice that we give, the next time they have a need and they come over here, I'm going to step off the stage, they come over here, rather than going back out to researching a solution and going to an active evaluation phase, they go into what's called the loyalty loop, which means they just come back to you. Listen, you did a great job on my cross-border transaction. I've got another one coming up that has a slight wrinkle to it, but I know that you can do an effective job at it. So they go into the loyalty loop. It's much cheaper right, to keep clients in the loyalty loop than it is to generate new clients. That's sort of marketing 101. Yet it's the area that we focus on the least, because oftentimes that experience is something we don't have control over. 
the second benefit of a loyalty loop, beyond the obvious revenue and cost-effective revenue, I'll call it, of uh, current clients, is that they then go tell other people about how great you are. This has been happening in our industries forever, right? Referrals. And they talk to other people during the active evaluation phase about how wonderful you are. And that's where the loyalty and influence uh, comes into play. So we would position for you that this really is the sales funnel in our industries, right? Pro professional services. And ultimately, the reason we developed a model like this is because we felt like anymore, we're not just building websites, we're not just building brochureware, but instead we're nurturing an experience that has to take place across the relationship cycle, right? You can't ignore any one part of this. Any breakdown in the chain ruins the entire experience for uh, the user. And I should also point out that while this is a digital conference and I'm talking primarily about digital solutions, the relationship cycle is relevant both offline and online, right? To create an experience for your audience, you've got to have both of, the, both, both of those things working together. So this is not a, a natively digital concept. So the relationship cycle is something you're going to see a lot today. We're going to refer back to it a lot because when we think about creating client experience, this is the model that we use. How do you treat your clients differently across the spectrum of the relationship cycle? So we developed uh, what we consider to, be, consider to be five truths of the relationship cycle. We thought a lot about this and we said, okay, what has to be in place for you to effectively exploit the relationship cycle? The first is the fact that you have to embrace your relationship-based business. We are constantly being challenged in this industry to come up with metrics that are really more B2C and non-relationship-based business oriented, like, you know, how many conversions did you get? We built that new website, so uh, how much revenue did that generate, right? These are irrelevant questions for what we do. Instead, we should be looking at how we're performing across the various stages of the relationship cycle and stop trying to be something we're not. We're relationship-based businesses. That's okay, right? This one might seem a little bit lofty, but um, I think it, it's absolutely relevant. Believe in a greater purpose. If you want to provide a great customer experience for your clients, right, everybody has to believe in the purpose, whatever that purpose might be because you can't have a breakdown in the chain. I'm gonna, I'm gonna show a few offline examples that are they're fairly amazing about organizations having purpose. You need to create a purposeful experience with content and context, and Jen Bullet is actually gonna talk a lot about this later. But this is obvious, be relevant, right? We hear this all the time, but it's easier said than done. Nurture the experience at every step. As I said before, you can't ignore any step in the relationship cycle, you have to focus on all of them. And finally, insist on accountability. There has to be accountability for the entire relationship and the experience. Unfortunately, the best examples we have about accountability are usually when there was a lack of accountability. So I'll jump on that bad wagon and talk about a few of those today as well. So those are the five truths for the relationship cycle. Uh, with that, I thought we'd, we'd get kicked off with a brand that we don't typically consider to be a relationship brand, right? McDonald's. Um, we buy hamburgers from McDonald's. That's all we do. Uh, but McDonald's realized, McDonald's in Canada actually realized that they had to start creating a relationship with their audience. And for them, their audience was uh, mothers, right? Why would I feed my kid Chicken McNuggets or why would I feed them a Big Mac? And they were getting all these questions and they realized they couldn't advertise their way out of this. They had to embrace the fact that there was a relationship aspect of their business and actually start answering some of these difficult questions that their audience had. That's the only way they were going to develop a trusting relationship. And so with that, I was going to actually play a quick two-minute video uh, about what they did. There are stories about us. McDonald's is both famous and infamous. Over the years, we've been picked at, poked at, discussed, and dissected. With food quality perception scores down, we decided to stop talking and start listening. Let's see. Any question of McDonald's? Well, I would like to know why they don't accommodate vegetarians. I'd like to know if it's actually 100% pure beef. We listened to every question, then answered them all, openly, honestly, in real time, and posted live for the world to see. Hi, I'm Hope Agazi, Director of Marketing for McDonald's Canada. And I'm here with a question from Isabel M. from Toronto, Ontario. She asks, why does your food look different in the advertising than what's in the store? It'll be a direct comparison of the right side of both burgers. Perfect. We're trying to like, dispel this myth that there's a company out there called 100% Pure Beef. And Mika, the answer is absolutely not. Beef comes in two types, in lean and fat. And instead of keeping the tough questions hidden, we made them louder. 
In a new video that's gone viral, McDonald's is revealing why their burgers look better in advertisements than they do in real life. Really the message is the food is whole, the food is real. You gotta have that Big Mac, and now the top chef at McDonald's is spilling the secret on how you can make that special sauce at home. And what started as a national campaign transformed the way people feel about McDonald's around the world. In all, we answered more than 20,000 questions, earned more than 14 million video views, and achieved dramatic gains on both food quality perception and brand trust scores. By opening up and letting them in, we made McDonald's a place people could be proud to love. I sure hope we're not having hamburgers for, uh, for lunch. <laughs> After seeing the different types of meat, I'm not sure I'm ready for that. But um, really interesting approach here, right? Uh, very open. But what they realized, and I'll go back to the Bob Garfield quote, is that conversations are going on about them, whether they liked it or not. Conversations online, conversations offline. I mean, how many times have we seen somebody feeding McDonald's and their kid and been like, ooh, they're the bad parent, you know? They knew that was happening, right? So they decided to actually engage in the conversation and create a relationship. Uh, now, obviously, their brand is very different than ours, but I think this is, this, this is really what shows you where the relationship era is going and why it's so important to embrace that, that even McDonald's can be considered a relationship-based business. Uh, just real quick, this is their website. If you go to McDonald's uh, Canada, it's called uh, Our Food, Your Questions. Just from a design perspective, it's a really great website. I won't spend a lot of time on it. What is fascinating is that I did a Google Images search and found all sorts of viral images around people taking screenshots of questions and McDonald's answers, which mean that people were actually listening and seeing this at subway stops, and uh, not subway sandwich stops, but like literally subway stops where they were putting up billboards and so forth, uh, and it actually went viral. So I wanted to switch to the second truth, and that is believing in a greater purpose. And this is an offline example that uh, I just think is amazing. Um, this is the Taj Mumbai Hotel. Has anybody stayed here? It's, it's supposedly one of the top 20 hotels in the world. And what's interesting about the Taj, Mo, uh, Taj Mumbai Hotel is their history. So this is created by the Tata family in India. And the reason they created it is because at the time that they created this hotel, Indians were not allowed to actually uh, stay as guests within their own hotels within India, right? The British said, you know, you, the Indians can't come in and stay as, uh, as hotel guests. And so the Tata family said, you know what, we're going to create a hotel the likes of which the British have never seen. And they did this a long time ago. I'm not exactly sure when they founded the hotel, but that was the aim of the business. So beautiful hotel, world renowned today. It's great. Uh, this is what that same hotel looked like in 2008. And this is, pardon me for the negative example, but this is uh, the 9-11 for India. This was when the Mumbai terrorist attacks occurred. And unfortunately, their hotel was targeted. But what came out of that is pretty amazing. So <clears throat> on the, uh, the third floor, uh, Unilever India was actually holding a banquet. And they had the executives and their significant others, a big party. There was a 24-year-old banquet manager who was in charge of this party. They heard all sorts of racket going on outside, knew something wasn't right. The 24-year-old banquet manager locked the doors, turned off the light, uh, got everybody out of the table, separated husbands and wives, right? didn't want to destroy families, purposely said, you have to separate, and continued to make sure her staff was serving water and trying to keep people calm while this chaos was going on outside. And then she made sure that everybody left. That's one example. Another example. In the same hotel, uh, there's a, a really well-known Japanese restaurant. And a 30-year employee, so a much more seasoned employee at the Taj Hotel, uh, had about 50 guests dining at the Japanese restaurant. And when this started happening, they did the same thing. He immediately put everyone in the corner underneath the tables. And then what's amazing is he and his staff actually formed a human cordon and blocked off uh, that aspect of the restaurant from any terrorists or would-be terrorists. And then he made sure that everyone got out. That's the second example. The third example is the hotel general manager whose family actually lives in the hotel. They live on the sixth floor. And there were, uh, as time went on, they were getting reports that the terrorists were moving up and the fires were moving up to the sixth floor. Well, this uh, general manager never even checked on his family and never called his own family to tell, uh, tell them how his 
immediate nuclear family was doing until after he got every person out of the hotel. And when you add these things together, what you realize is that you know, this is nothing that you can teach in a manual, right? This is extreme customer experience, right? This is in, ingrained in them in a greater purpose. And the Harvard Business Review actually studied this event because they were amazed that they could have this great of a purpose. But the point is, is that if you go back to why the, uh, the Taj Mumbai was founded, they were founded to provide the best service and the best hotel experience in the world. And they accomplished that even at a time when there were no manuals or anybody telling them what they should be doing. So the reason purpose is so important is that if everybody in the relationship cycle or everyone who's fostering the relationship cycle is not on board with the purpose, then it's going to break down, right? If just one of those, uh, those people in the Taj Mumbai Hotel said, oh, I'm out of here, I'm you know, taken off, right? It would have broken down the whole experience. Pretty amazing uh, example. So bring it back closer to, uh, to our world. This is Ernst & Young. They just rolled out a new campaign. And I think this, this does a good job of getting closer to purpose uh, than most organizations. And, and we like this example. Actually, Kyle of Pekna pointed this out to me um, at One North. Uh, this is the ENY Building a Better World, Working World campaign. And you know, they have basically stated what their purpose is. And it's outlined here by the CEO. Uh, the idea was, they said, look, we're accountants, we're tax lawyers, we're consultants, et cetera. But like, how do we relate to the world in a, in a bigger way? And so they, they rolled out this campaign and really have tried to put the context around what they do and basically say, look, like if we don't do what we do, capital doesn't flow the way it should. There are inefficiencies in the market, et cetera. And so they've built a purpose around it. Now, I think there's a lot more that has to be done. I'm not sure how measurable their purpose is, et cetera. It seems a little bit lofty right now. But it is an example of using purpose. The other interesting thing about purpose, and again, I'll go back to something that Kalev has always said, and that is that if you have the right purpose, people will want to join it. Right? People want to work at the Taj Mumbai because it provides that experience. People want to work at ENY because they recognize the importance of uh, ENY's position within the business community. So believing in a greater purpose. I want to talk a little bit about um, creating experience with content and context. This is an opportunity for information technology leaders to actually create revenue streams rather than be a cost center. I'll just give you a few examples um, offline, or I'm sorry, online, but in the business to consumer world. Uh, this is uh, providing contextual experience now, not just based on what somebody is interested in, but based on their location, right? And so here, this is IKEA. If you're in an IKEA store, it's a zoo. They actually provide a map and like an arrow as to like where you should go. Well, now you can actually know where you are in the store and be able to find the product very easily. Uh, this is amazing. Walmart, who I don't usually think of as being sort of ahead of the game in terms of technology, has now added context by when you're actually shopping in their stores, you can use this beta app of theirs to scan the product code as you're taking it off the shelf. And then when you go to check out, you don't have to wait. All you do is go up, scan that code to a, uh, a monitor of some sort, put in your credit card information, and you leave. It's that fast. It's basically self-checkout, but as you go through it, right? So they're creating uh, content and context here. Sephora, I don't actually use their products, believe it or not. Uh, yeah, exactly. Um, but they offer ratings uh, right online through their app, so real-time information. And Home Depot, they've got a great app that will show you how to navigate their stores and will also give you uh, videos and things that are relevant as you peruse through the store aisles, right? So if you're in the, you know, the, whatever, the door aisle, they'll tell you how to install a door and have a video for it that you can access from the app. Pretty cool stuff. So how does it relate to us? Um, a few examples. This is uh, Baker McKenzie. There's a number of folks from Baker McKenzie in the room. This is uh, their app. I believe they call it the Global Equity Matrix. So depending on where you are in the world, if you're wondering what the tax treatment for stock options might be, you can actually put in your location and find out what the tax treatment is. It's pretty cool, especially if you're an investment banker and you're doing cross-border deals, right? I mean, you could go to uh, India and figure out how, uh, what the tax implications of providing equity-based compensation are. Another example from some other people in the room, Founders Workbench, uh, the Goodwin Proctor folks, uh, rolled out a website that's really based around the context of entrepreneurs. So the idea here is if I'm an entrepreneur, I probably don't know a whole lot necessarily about what legal services I need, but I know what I need to do to get my business up and running, and that's financing, operating, hiring, growing, and protecting. And the law firm in this case, Goodwin Proctor, is able to actually develop their content around those things that their audience cares about, the context, and then provide it to them online, uh, as well as through a web-based app. Uh, 
I thought I'd go back to this quote at the top here. How many people were at the San Francisco LMA last week, the tech show? Yeah, great show. It was a lot of fun. They had a very interesting character in a panel. His name is uh, Casey Flaherty. And you might not know him by name, but you've probably heard of him because of what he does to his outside counsel. He is the corporate counsel for Kia Motors. He used to work at a large law firm. Uh, and he gives all of his outside counsel a technology test. So he will actually give them a set of tasks that they are to perform within one hour. And this includes using Excel, PowerPoint, Word, et cetera. He says he can do it in 30 minutes. Uh, I think the, and you guys got to keep me honest on this, the fastest any law firm has done it in uh, was what, eight hours? Or yeah. Maybe it was two hours, I can't remember. Uh, and some just like gave up, right? And had other people within the firm try and take it. Uh, the point is, is uh, that he was saying, look, you need to be more efficient. I expect you to have the same skills I do. But he said something at this presentation that I thought was really relevant for our conversation today, and that was, you know, don't send me articles that you think I'd care about just to connect, just to keep yourself relevant. Like, if you're going to send me something, if you're going to provide me with value, make it real, right? Make sure it's something I really give a hoot about, right? And that's what the apps and the Founders Workbench website, they're great examples of doing that. Uh, it also makes us rethink our, our email marketing activities, right? He gets really annoyed when he gets the check-in uh, call from a lawyer uh, just to see what's going on. He actually wants uh, really relevant information, content, and context. Uh, I thought this was fun. Um, if you have your mobile device handy, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but we've been playing with this internally. This is an app called Topi, and what this does is it creates connections uh, of people that are in the same proximity. So. If you download this now, and you can do that, it might be sort of fun to do before lunch, go to the App Store, download Topi, hook it up with your LinkedIn profile. It'll actually uh, walk you through that process. And it will access a couple of things. It'll access where you went to school, it'll access where you've worked, what industries you're in. This is mine, so it's got technology. Somehow, it's got me related to government. I've never worked in government, not really sure what's going on there. Uh, Accenture, a number of us are from Accenture. Originally, Thomson Reuters. And then what it does is it looks for people around you, like in this room, that have similar background. This is pretty interesting. Now I know, you know what connections I have. Maybe we don't have to go through that exercise that Brant made us do at the beginning of the, uh, the day today, right? Where we learn about each other. Instead, the app does it for us. Yeah, it's a lot more fun to go through it. Uh, so download this, and let's see. It'll actually um, beep when you have connections that are near to you. So uh, during lunch, maybe this will foster some conversation. But a uh, great example of creating an experience with content and context. How many people use Amazon Prime? How many of you would recommend it to a friend? Love Amazon Prime, right? Great example of nurturing loyalty at every step. You are in the loyalty loop. And you've paid to be in the loyalty loop. They charge you for Amazon Prime. This is brilliant, right? They charge you like 89 bucks to be a loyal customer. It's, it's absolutely awesome marketing. Now, I'm sort of joking that they charge for this because I would, I would argue that on balance they probably lose money on the $89 fee. That's just sort of a, a way to, to defer cost. Uh, but for those of you who aren't familiar with Amazon Prime, or Amazon Prime, basically you buy a product and it's shipped to you within uh, two days at no additional cost to you. It's just an amazing service. Uh, it really greases the wheels in terms of purchasing products. My wife now does all of her shopping on Amazon for Christmas and, and other holidays. Uh, we were actually selling a house, and she bought a bathtub, I kid you not, on Amazon. Um, bought the bathtub, had it shipped. Bathtub's pretty big. Uh, this thing had to weigh like 400 pounds. They put it in our garage. The contractors moved it all the way up to the third floor. They realized there was a crack in the bathtub. And so she's like, no problem. I bought it on Amazon Prime, right? Took it back downstairs, they came, Bork lifted it out of our garage and brought us a new one, all for 89 bucks. What would that have cost me if I didn't have Amazon Prime? But the point here is that they've thought about loyalty. And while they might have to spend a little more on people like me who uh, had to have their bathtub removed from their house, uh, they know that loyalty counts more and costs less than awareness. And they've thought long and hard about that loyalty loop. So in the interest of time, I'm gonna move forward here Last thing I want to talk about is insisting on accountability. You can't successfully achieve a customer experience across the relationship cycle unless you have accountability. And as I said before, it's more fun to focus on the negative examples here than the positive examples, because when things go positively, you never hear about them. Uh, but I will focus on BP. 
This is a screenshot that I took uh, yesterday, actually. I've always liked BP for some reason. I like their visual identity. It's sort of refreshing. Uh, actually, their stores are very clean. If you have to stop there on a road trip, uh, it's not a bad place to go. They're much more modern than like any other gas station, at least within this area. Um, but what I thought was interesting was uh, I was doing a little bit of research on their, their visual identity because I really liked it. And I came to the visual identity site, and this is what it said. BP brand and logo, and then it said being green and yellow. And I was just like, really? Can you really say that when you know, we looked from outer space and saw this right during this oil spill? And then at the same time, you, know, you uh, have constantly been trading off uh, the environment for your own profits, and reports are coming out saying this. And the fact that rather than fix something for $150,000, you valued a life at $10 million and decided not to make the, the actual fix. And worst of all, your CEO, during the course of all this, decided to go sailing with his son uh, around the UK. Uh, because obviously, he couldn't go sailing in the Gulf because his company spilled oil all over the place. And you know, I sort of wrapped this all together. I'm like, even today, they have on their website, they are a green organization. And you're like, are you serious? Is this really accountability? How can you sit here and say that? And so when you think of the relationship cycle, I would say that this is very disingenuous. They've clearly had an accountability breakdown. So I, I'm going to wrap up here because we have to, uh, to break for lunch. Um, but we started the, the conversation with predictions, right? the New York Times predictions. Uh, and here's, here's a prediction that I really like. This is from the Harvard Business Review. We've pointed this many times in presentations before. But what I like about it is that it basically says that we need to spend more time focusing on the digital relationship. And while it might be disruptive and challenging right now, the reality is it gets us closer to our customer. And particularly for those of us in professional services where we're oftentimes a couple steps removed, digital is an opportunity to get much closer to the customer than we've ever been before. And when we do that, ultimately, it's going to pay off. So with that, I'm going to conclude my remarks. I actually have 34 seconds left, according to this. Excellent. But I'm going to hand it over to you, Brent. Thanks. That's just the amount of time I need. So thank you so much. Thanks.